You may be seated. Thank you so much. If one of you young guys could run me one of them bottles of water, they laid a bottle down there, I believe, but I didn't get it up here, and I'm afraid I may need it. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. God bless you. All right, take your Bibles, if you would, to the book of the Revelation, chapter number 12. And uh, let me say that I always enjoy coming here and uh, being at uh, First Baptist Indian Trail. One of the main reasons I love coming here is because you're a pastor, the man of God that he is, and the friend that he's been. Appreciate his uh, kindness toward me and toward our ministry. And um, I'm praying that God will do a great work. We had a good service, first service, praying that God will do a great work here and then in our final service at 11 o'clock. Before I speak to you, I'm going to give my story in a moment. Then I'm going to talk to you also about your story in uh, connection with mine. And um, but I want to tell you something we've been telling in all of our meetings and sharing in all of our events uh, for the last 16 months. Uh, two things in particular that will give you pause. One will give you pause to greatly rejoice and to pray for it. And the other one will be somewhat uh, sad and uh, tragic and will also give you pause to pray. And January the 7th of 19, uh, 2017, my oldest granddaughter, Emma Nicole, uh, and I were on a flight from Dallas to Jacksonville, Florida, where we would, on uh, once landing in Jacksonville, get a rental car and then drive to Beaufort, South Carolina, where on Sunday I would speak to about 3,000 Marines and Marine recruits at uh, Paris Island. We've been doing this now for six years. We go every uh, 12 to 13 weeks. Uh, they asked uh, a, a chaplain, chaplain, Steve Benefield, called me seven years ago and said, would you be interested to come and speak? Well, of course, I was interested, but I speak at a lot of bases, military bases here at home and overseas as well. But a lot of them are gratuitous type invitations. I, they want me to come and talk for 10 minutes, give me an award or a plaque or something. And the older I get, the less appeal those things have for me. I just want to see people get saved, see lives change. And, but... They assured me that that was not what this was. This is what they call Sunday morning Protestant chapel. We would have between an hour and a half to two hours without any restrictions. I said, well, I don't get that kind of liberty in some Baptist churches I go to. <laughs> and uh, so they went through the process. They ha I agreed that I wanted to do it then. So then they had to get the approval of the powers that be. And the final uh, approval had to come from the CEO of the base for the first time in the history of uh, Paris Island, they had a uh, female uh, commanding officer, Brigadier General Lori Reynolds, two-star general. She's about six foot four, and she looks like a Marine. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and she was raised a Catholic her entire life. And about eight years ago, maybe a little longer now, she was invited to a, lady, a ladies' Bible study, and they were studying the Gospel of John. And for the first time in her life, she understands what the Gospel is, and she gets saved. And so now she's in a decision to make a decision whether I'm going to come and speak at Paris Island. And God's timing is always right. And so they showed her a DVD of me speaking at Prestonwood. They said she had, said she had tears in her eyes and said, yes, our recruits need to hear uh, uh, this Marine. So now we've been 21 times. We bring in a worship team from Jacksonville, Florida, Mark Ivey, one of the great worship leaders in America. They come with their A team. First of all, on Saturday night, we bring a sound team in. Four men come in with this extensive sound system, this 6,000-seat all-weather building, and it takes these guys seven to eight hours to set this sound system up. Otherwise, the sound would be atrocious. They wouldn't hear half of what was said or was going on. And then Mark Ivey on Sunday morning comes and leads in worship and praise for 45 to 50 minutes. Here are 4,000 Marine recruits singing, God's not dead, we'll put goosebumps on top of your goosebumps. And then I get up and preach, and then I give a public invitation for people to come to Christ. And, and this is a very conservative number. What I'm about to give you is going to blow some of your minds. But some of the chaplains would tell you the numbers are a great deal higher than what I'm about to tell you right now. In 21 events that we've now done at Paris Island, and three events that we've done at MCRD San Diego, 
we have seen over 25,000 Marines and Marine recruits get out of their seat and come and give their hearts to Jesus Christ. My wife is here. She'll tell you, you, you just sit there and tears just stream down your face. They just keep coming. They keep coming with brokenness and tears and conviction. We will be back there three more times. As a matter of fact, we're there next Sunday for our second event of this year. We'll be back three times this year, four more times in 19, four times in 2024 times in 2021. They tell me that we can keep doing these as long as we want to. I wish I had the time to tell you about what's maybe getting ready to happen at San Diego. If we don't have time, just pray about that, and God knows. But then when Emma and I landed in Jacksonville, we turned on our phones. We got the, soon got the tragic news that Emma's sisters, Sarah and Allie, have been in a horrible ATV accident. A man left the road, left the shoulder of the road, 70 miles an hour, and plowed into the back of their ATV. And our 16-year-old Ali was killed instantly, and Sarah was seriously injured, had to be cut out of the vehicle, then they had to be care flighted to uh, Fort Worth. She is our miracle girl, beyond a doubt. She played a full season of volleyball this year at school, a full season of basketball as well. Just got back off of a mission trip with, to Belize. And, um, but Allie was a most unusual 16-year-old girl. She loved God. She was so uh, beautiful. She, she uh, was so smart. She didn't get that from her papa. She, she was so athletic. And she was the whole package. She was everything that you would want in your daughter, your granddaughter. We know where she's at. That's not the deal. We rejoice. We're going to see Allie again. I don't know how the world does this at all, but it still hurts. And um, so I want you to pray, especially for my daughter and, and my son-in-law. They're two of the godliest people I know of anywhere, Jan and Steve. If you want to follow the story, you go to my daughter's Facebook page, Jana Lee Hooten, Jana Lee Hooten, and uh, it'll move you. It'll move you to tears, and you'll 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 get a word from God in her writings. It's just an anointed thing that God's using her uh, to help other people while ministering to herself as well. And so please remember to pray for our family and pray for our marine events. What is your story today? What, what's your testimony? And you go out to the cemetery and you see the headstone of a person. We know something about the person that is buried in that spot. We know their name, of course, and then maybe something about their family their military career, maybe a, a favorite Bible verse. But then there's always the two dates. There's the date that the person was born, and there's the date that the person died. And ladies and gentlemen, young people, there's something even more important than the two dates. In between the dates is the little dash, and it's what's on your dash that matters the most. What happened between the time you took your first breath until the time you take your last breath? That is called your story. That's your testimony. I hold in my hand a, a book full of stories, Old Testament and New Testament as well, men and women. It all started with Adam. Did you men ever stop to think what it would have been like to have been Adam? Adam had a wife and never had a mother-in-law. That's a story. <laughs> Adam had a story, and Noah had a story. Abraham and Moses and Joshua had stories. David and Joseph and Daniel and Shadrach and Nehemiah and, and Joan and Stephen and Paul and John, all of them had stories. There's a chapter in the book of Hebrews listed we refer to as the faith chapter, and there's one man after the other listed in that chapter because of their great faith. And then right in the middle of that book, God puts a woman by the name of Rahab. Rahab, you know, Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab was a harlot. And yet there came a day in her life when she too put her faith and her trust in God. And God thinks so much of her faith that he puts her in the faith chapter. I'm talking to someone today, and you've blown it, and you've messed up, and you shipwrecked, and you think, I cannot possibly have a story but I'm here to tell you today because you're in the building and because you're breathing air, there's hope for you today. My God is a God of a second chance and sometimes a third and sometimes even a fourth. 
as some of us can testify. So look at Revelation chapter number 12. Look at verse 7. And there was war in heaven. It all starts with a war. And if you read chapter 19, it's all going to end in a war. And we win. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. His dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. And neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now the question is how? Would they overcome this accuser, this fallen angel, Lucifer, this one that's referred to in verse number seven as, or verse number nine as the great dragon, the old serpent, the devil, and Satan? How would they overcome it? And even a better question for you and I today is how are you and I going to overcome? How will we overcome this great accuser? Two ways. Verse number 11 tells us, and they overcame him, here it is, by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. What's your story? What's your testimony? I was raised in a preacher's home. I wish everyone could have been raised in the kind of home that I was raised in. It wasn't a perfect home by no stretch of the imagination, but it was a great home, a great family. Uh, Mom and dad, there were five of us children. Now, you know what you do when you're a preacher's kid? You do a lot. You go to church. You go to church a whole bunch. And... And I told a group of kids the other day I was on drugs. When I was nine years old, mom and dad drug us to church on Sunday morning. They drug us back Sunday night. We went to church all the time. And listen, it was good for us. We learned things at church. But let me tell you something. We also learned things at home. The things that we were taught at home were simply just reinforced at church. And because we had already been taught them at home. You know what? We were taught in our home that the Bible is the Word of God. We were taught that there's only one true and living God. And, and that's not the God of the, of the Buddhist. That's got not the God of the Hindu. That's not the God of the Muslim. Let me tell you something, friend. The God of the Buddha, the Hindu, and the Muslim is not the God of this Bible. We serve a true and a living God. We were taught that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. We were taught there's not a whole lot of ways to go to heaven. There's only one way, and that Jesus is that way. We were taught that in our home. It makes a difference, parents, how you raise your children. It makes a difference what you teach your children. And grandparents, I'm finding out that it's even important in our day and age for grandparents to get involved in the lives of their grandchildren. Doesn't mean you take over. Doesn't mean that's your responsibility. But you can invest in your grandchildren and pour into your grandchildren's lives. Listen to these verses, especially the young parents here this morning. Listen to these verses from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here, um, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And verse number 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou settest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. What are you talking about? The Word of God. And uh, when are you talking about it? When you sit down, and when you rise up, and when you go by the way. And who are you talking about it to? To your children. Hey, as important as it is for your children to be in Sunday school, that is important. And to be in a, maybe in a water program or even a Christian academy, a Christian school, that's great, that's wonderful. But hey, it's not their primary responsibility to teach your children the Word of God. It is your responsibility to teach them the Word of God. There is an all-out attack on our children in America. And parents, this is why you've got to be diligent. It's why you've got to uh, be careful and invest in the lives of your children. Atheism is on the rise in America and throughout the world. When, when I was young, Matt Lamora Hare was, uh, was the token atheist, and she was kind of weird and kind of funny, and people laughed at her. But these people today are organized, and they're smart, and they, and, and, and they know what they're doing. They're trying to take over. They want God out of everything. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember when the Russian... Uh, uh, so Soviet Union sent their first 
uh, uh, cosmonauts in the outer space and they came back to the earth. The world was watching. The media was there. And one of these Russian cosmonauts said, we've been to outer space and we did not see God. And since we did not see God, that must mean there is no God. And the next Sunday at the Great First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, the pastor, Dr. W.A. Criswell exclaimed to his people, and he said, Ah, oh, if only they would have stepped out of their spaces, then they would have seen God. <laughs> Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. And, and, so, and so it's important. And, and I was raised in that kind of a home. And then whenever, whenever I was 10, only 10 years of, old, uh, of age, the most important thing that would ever happen to me happened on a Sunday morning. North City Baptist Church, North City, Illinois, sitting on the second row on the right hand side. My dad is preaching. And for the first time that I can remember in my life, I got under conviction. Now, I don't know whether you understand conviction or not, but in a simple uh, sentence or two, it simply means that that's when God himself comes to talk to you personally about big stuff like death and life and heaven and hell and eternity and man when conviction comes especially if you're in church you're probably the most miserable person in the room you would like for that preacher just to shut up no more singing somebody please help me get me out of this building but hey if conviction was to come to you today while I'm speaking you know what that means, that means God loves you. That means God's speaking to you. That means God's trying to draw you unto himself. That means God wants you to be saved. He wants you to have a personal relationship with him. Listen to this. He wants you to spend eternity with him in this awesome place called heaven. And that morning, as a 10-year-old child, conviction came to my life. My dad was preaching, man, I was miserable. Matter of fact, when the invitation started, all I could see was hell. Someone said you shouldn't get saved just to stay out of hell. Well, maybe not, but that's not a bad reason to get saved. And <laughs> I left my seat that morning, and I went and knelt, and my mom came and knelt beside me as a 10-year-old boy. I repented of my sins, received Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I got born into the family of God. Ladies and gentlemen, young people, that is the most important thing that has ever happened in my life. Listen to me, if you've been saved, that is the most important thing that's ever happened in your life. And I've got to be truthful, I've got to be frank, I've got to be upfront with you today. If you've never been saved, then your life is incomplete. You might be the richest man in this county, you might be the richest woman in this county, but if you don't know Jesus... Your life is incomplete. You might be the strongest man in this room. You might be the most beautiful woman in this room. But if you don't know Jesus, your life is incomplete. You, today, you need Jesus. Well, I was so happy. I was excited. Told family and friends what had happened in my life. But then, when I became a teenager, something else happened in my life. It never happened overnight. But gradually, I began to put things before God, football and Basketball and baseball and track and field, these things soon became my gods. And my dad told me, Tim, there's nothing wrong with you playing ball unless you put it before God. And then it's wrong. Well, I didn't want to listen to that and little by little putting these things before God in my life. I began to have problems. I began to rebel. I rebelled at school. I rebelled against God. I rebelled against mom and dad. You say, Tim, what did your parents do when you rebelled? They had never read any of Dr. Spock's books on child psychology. He thought that if children were uh, needing uh, uh, to get something out of their system, that whatever it took for them to get it out of their system, let them do it. If it would help them to uh, uh, pick up a rock and throw it through the window, if that would help them get the frustration out of them, well, let them throw the rock through the window. Well, my dad had other ways of getting that frustration out. <laughs> yeah. We lived on a farm for a little while, and behind the farmhouse was a willow tree. Now, I don't know whether you know what willow trees are good for or not, but you don't get any fruit off of them. They're not even a good shade tree. The only thing they're good for is to get a switch off of. The only praying I did back then was for that tree to die, and it never did die. <laughs> I'd have to go out and get my own switch. I'd be hurting before I got back because I knew what was about to happen. They would always talk to us before they spanked us. And they would say something like this, Tim, 
this is going to hurt me a whole lot worse than it's going to hurt you. I thought, isn't that dumb? If you'll give me that switch, I'll show you who it's going to hurt the world. I said many times, even before I joined the Marines, that I served under the stars and the stripes. My dad furnished the stripes, and I saw the stars. Amen. But they believed in old-fashioned discipline, but many times I would slip out behind their back to do what I wanted to do. I attended a public school. Most of my friends were not saved. Most of their parents were not Christians. I made up my mind as a teenager I could live my own life. My junior year, I set records in the long jump and the hurdles, winning ribbons and trophies, but getting further and further and further away from God. Tim, what did God do? God declares in Revelation 3, verse 19, as many as I love, oh, listen to those words again, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Five of my high school friends were killed in car wrecks. Every time I would see one of them in a casket, I knew that it could have been me. God would speak to my heart, but I wouldn't listen. I kept running. I kept rebelling. I graduated from high school, started college in the day, working nights. In the meantime, my life continues to be one disaster after another. And I didn't think it could get any worse, but it wasn't long until I got fired from my job. I got kicked out of college. Nowhere to go, nothing to do. And again, my life full of confusion. Walking down the street in my hometown, McLeansboro, Illinois, I went by the post office. I noticed a sign. And I'd seen the sign before, but it never got my attention like it did that day. Picture of a young man in a sharp-looking uniform. At the top of the sign, it said, The Marines are looking for a few good men. I didn't know who the rest of them were, but I went in and told that recruiter that I found at least one of what you're all looking for. Now, to be real frank with you young people, I was tired of living at home. I wanted to change. I wanted something different. I was tired of being told what time to go to bed and what time to get out of bed and how to get my hair cut and what I could do and could not do, so I joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> it wasn't the most intelligent thing I ever did. They sent me to Paris Island. I got off of that bus on those yellow foot. Prince, and I met the guy they called drill instructor. I was there less than 24 hours when I decided I didn't like him and he didn't like me. And the reason I didn't like him was because he was in authority and I was rebellious toward all authority. And I was soon to discover that no matter where I would ever go in this life, there would always be authority with God being the supreme in all authority. I laid awake nights, platoon 305, thinking about my life, the shame, the disgrace, that I brought to my dad's ministry to my own family. My attitude began to change in boot camp. They had some things to help it change. I graduated from boot camp with a meritorious promotion, private to private first class, then went to ITR, and then to engineering school at Camp Lejeune, graduated with another meritorious promotion, private first class to Lance Corporal, and then I received my orders that I was to go to South Vietnam. I had three weeks leave. I went home to Illinois and spent those three weeks with mom and dad. On Sunday before I was to leave on Monday, I went to church with my parents. And in the service that day, I thought that I made things right with God. On Monday, mom and dad drove me to St. Louis. And I got on that plane and it no more got off the runway. I told God that I couldn't do it. Those men were Marines. I was afraid they'd laugh at me. I was afraid they'd make fun of me. Went to Vietnam. was there for nine months. And I didn't go back to doing a lot of the things that I'd done before, but friend, listen, if you're not for the Lord, then you're against him. For the Christian in this room today, there is no middle ground. Today you're either helping the cause of Jesus Christ or you are hurting the cause of Jesus Christ. I had opportunity after opportunity to live for God. Mom sent me a Bible. And on the inside of that Bible, she wrote these words, Tim, this Bible can keep you from sin or well, sin can keep you from this Bible. I put it in the bottom of my footlocker. I had no prayer life. I had no testimony. There was a black Marine in my squad by the name of Lee Gore. Lee and I flew to Vietnam on the same plane. We were the best of friends. He was a Christian living for God. I was saved, but I was running from God. Oftentimes, I'd seen him sit down at Edward's rack and read his Bible openly witness and talk to other Marines about the Lord. And I knew this was the story. This is the testimony. This is the life that I was supposed to live. But I wouldn't do it. 
30 days left in Nam and my top sergeant offered me a desk job. Meant that I didn't have to go back out to the field. And that was where the primary danger was. But for some reason, I told him I'd rather spend the rest of my time with my own men. I was told to take them on a minesweep. I've been on a lot of minesweeps. The only thing particularly different about this one was that most of my men were new in Vietnam. The only training that most of them had on a minesweep was what they'd gotten back in the States, and that was a lot different than walking an actual minesweep. I got my men together early that morning, March the 8th, 1971. I told my men that day that I would walk point. Point man was the first man in the squad, 15, 20 meters, another Marine, 15, 20 meters, and another Marine, and we'd be staggered out in that type of formation. Normally, I would have been in the back of the squad with the radium and the corps and the lieutenant. Wasn't trying to be a hero or anything like that. Simply showing my men how to walk point. Our job is to locate landmines and rounds that had not yet been detonated and to clear the area of those devices. We walked that morning without any trouble. We found a couple of rounds. We detonated them. We stopped at noon hour to eat. And while I was eating, my friend, Lee Gore, asked me if I wanted him to take over. As point man, Gore could have very easily have done it. He was as well trained as I. But for some reason, I told him I would finish out the day. And then on tomorrow, he could show the new men. We picked up where we left off from. And 45 minutes later, I stepped on a 60-pound mine. It blew me several feet into the air. It ripped both of my legs off of my body. I should have been killed instantly as a big enough mine to destroy a jeep. We'd entered a major minefield simultaneously. A South Korean Marine serving with us stepped on a mine at the exact moment that I did and lost one of his legs. Our bulldozer driver set his blade down on a mine. We're now in a major minefield. Some of my men think that we're taking on small arms fire. And there's chaos and confusion, smoke and noise, and I'm in extreme pain. In the midst of all that noise and confusion and my pain, I looked up and my head was lay in the lap of that black Marine. Lee wasn't cussing the president of the communists of the Vietnamese or no one else, but rather with tears streaming down his face, praying and asking God to help me. And I can remember today as though it happened five minutes ago, Quang Nam province, a little after 1.30 in the afternoon. I looked up that day, and I made my prayer. It wasn't long, it wasn't fancy, but I begged God to let me live. I wanted to live. Someone said, you've never lived till you almost died. I know what that means. They came with the medevac chopper, carried me to the hospital ship, the USS Sanctuary. Second day I was on that ship, two naval doctors gave up. They didn't think I was going to make it with all the, all the uh, 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 temperature and all the infection and numerous other things that I was facing all coming at one time. Dr. Bailey was one of those doctors. He and I were reunited a few years ago in Garland, Texas, and he told the people, a thousand of them that night, that they did not expect me to live. But God had a plan for my life. I lay on the hospital ship for two weeks. They took me to the island of Guam. On the naval hospital, I spent the next two weeks, unconscious most of that time. I weighed 187 pounds before I was hit. The island of Guam, I weighed a little less than 80 pounds. During that first four weeks, Mom and Dad received visits from the Marines, the Red Cross, numerous telegrams, and from all that they had been told, they didn't expect to see their oldest son alive again. But God had a plan for my life. In Dayton, Ohio, Earl Lewis came to hear me speak at a crusade. Earl was the fifth man back on the mine sweep that day. He'd only been in Vietnam for six weeks. He told Connie and I that it looked like someone took a five-gallon bucket of red paint and poured it all over me. He said, not a one of my men thought that I would live. In that crusade, Earl gave his heart to Jesus Christ and now is a faithful member of that church. God had a plan for my life. They brought me back to the States of the Philadelphia Naval Hospital where I spent the next eight months, eight long months, 13 major operations. When the doctors were through and all the surgeries were over, I had three inches remaining on my right leg, 11 inches on my left, but no other part of my body was hurt. Some would tell us today there was nothing more than an accident, but I remind you that with God, there are no accidents. God was not asleep on March the 8th, 1971. You see, as a 10-year-old boy, I said yes to Jesus Christ, but as a teenager, I decided that I could live my own life, and I made a choice, a deliberate choice, to run. And I ran and ran and ran until March the 8th, 1971, when the running was over. I went home to the hospital of my dad's church in southern Illinois. 
I went forward and publicly made things right. It was in that church that I met Connie. We fell in love with each other and were soon married and just recently celebrated our 46th wedding anniversary. God's given us three wonderful children and six awesome grandchildren. It wasn't long after we were married that God called me to preach. Friends and even relatives tried to discourage me. They said, be so hard, so difficult. But I said, if that's what God wants me to do, then that's what I'll do. I pastored for five years in southern Illinois. Now I'm a 40th year as an evangelist. I've had the privilege to speak in every state with the exception of North Dakota. I don't even think anybody lives up there anymore. And, <laughs> and many, many foreign countries preaching God's word. And I'm going to tell you now, like I've said so many times, the past 47 plus years of my life have absolutely been the happiest years of my life. You said, but Tim, you're in a wheelchair. Your legs are gone. You told us about Allie. Yes, but I'm also telling you today that I am in the will of God. And that is what makes all the difference in the world. Here's how the book of Job says it. Here's how Job says it in chapter 5 and verse 17. Happy is the man whom God correcteth. Wow. You say, Tim, you tell us that God would do something like that to a person? No, God doesn't necessarily do things to us. He does things for us because he loves us, because he cares for us, and because we are his children. Listen carefully. You're saved today, but you're out of the will of God? Then I plead with you. I beg you, don't leave the doors of this building today until you make it right with God. And there may be a great number of people listening to my voice right now, and you've never been saved. Your life has never, ever been changed by the power of God. The next two minutes will be the most important words that I would have said here today. Don't let anything or anyone interrupt what I'm about to tell you right now. A little over 2,000 years ago, God sent his only son to this earth. God didn't have 20 sons. God didn't have two sons. God had one son, Jesus Christ. He came to this earth born of a virgin. He lived here for nearly 20 33 sinless, spotless years. He did no wrong. The only one to ever live a perfect life on this earth was God's son, Jesus. And then one day, he walked up Calvary's hill willingly, laid down his life for your sins and for my sins and for the sins of the whole world. He hung on a cross suspended between heaven and earth. And on that cross, he shed his blood. And on that cross, he died. God's son died. They took him off of that cross and they carried him and, and they put him in a borrowed tomb. Now ladies and gentlemen and young people right here, among other things, is what separates Christianity from every other single religion on the face of the earth. For if you were to go to the place where they put the body of Jesus, you wouldn't find him. He's not there. On the third day, he got up from the grave, victorious over sin, victorious over death, victorious over hell. And today, God's son is alive. And here's the great news. He wants to come and live in your life. You say, well, Tim, how does that happen? How does God's son come and live in my life? You come to this place. We're not talking about this building, this geographical location. We're talking about this moment. In your life, to understand in the sight of this holy God that you're a sinner. The Bible says so. We've all sinned. Every one of us have sinned and come short of God's glory. And it is our sin that separates us from God. And there's only one way to be reconciled to this one true and holy God. And that's through his son, the one who paid the price for our sins on the cross. When he shed his blood and when he died on the cross and when he got up from that grave three days later, that's the only way to be reconciled. When you turn to Jesus, you put your faith and your trust in Jesus. Hey, wouldn't you like to know that when you die, that you would spend eternally with God in this beautiful place called heaven forever and ever and ever? You say, Tim, I'm not planning on dying anytime soon. I don't imagine any of us are planning it, but I tell people all the time, you don't have to go to heaven and you don't have to go to hell. But you can't stay here. You're going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. And it depends upon what you do with Jesus. Today could be the greatest day of your entire life. If you put your faith and your trust 
in Jesus. Would you bow your heads this morning? I'm going to ask that no one leave the building unless it's an emergency. If it's an emergency, we understand. I want to ask you something. I want you to be honest. How many in this room today would say, Tim, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt if my heart was to stop beating right now, the next four minutes in this seat where I'm at, EMT comes in this room and officially pronounces me dead. Tim, I know that I would go to heaven. I remember the day when conviction came to my life. I repented of my sins, received Jesus Christ, and God saved me. I'm not talking about my church membership. I'm not talking about my baptism. I'm not talking about good works. I remember the day when I got saved. Tim, I'm saved, and I'm not the least bit ashamed of it. No one looking. Let me see your hand today. As a way of testimony, hold them up high. Oh. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.